Exactly like moi, Sherlock Holmes was a connoisseur of good French wines. Chateauneuf du Pape, in this case. Actually, he liked Burgundies. He liked Montrachet, Meursault, and a port from time to time. In the sign of four, he drinks red Burgundy for lunch. <laughs> and in the Gloria Scott, he drinks port after dinner. In The Adventure of the Dying Detective, Holmes refreshes himself with a glass of claret. In The Last Bowl, he tries a bottle of Imperial Tokay, etc., etc. He also liked whiskey, soda, and he had a gasogen um, soda maker in his sitting room for making soda water. He drank brandy, although he claimed that it was for medicinal purposes. And occasionally, because he is British after all, a, he was British after all, a glass of beer. He was also an expert on alcohol, alcoholic drinks, spirits as they were called, beer, etc. And he used this knowledge to solve some of his more complex and difficult cases. But the dark side of Sherlock Holmes was coke, cocaine. And today I'm going to discuss Sherlock Holmes' addiction to cocaine as well as Sigmund Freud's experimentation with the drug of the devil. Now, I've already made one video about cocaine and its impacts on the mind. It was a video presentation uh, in an international conference and I used a survey of literature to prove that cocaine gives rise to grandiosity. Actually, the use of cocaine creates a pretty convincing facsimile of narcissistic personality disorder. And if you're a long-term user of coke, two years, three years, etc., your personality is likely to change in a way that you would become grandiose, reckless, a bit psychopathic, actually. And I know personally of one such case, at least. Now, cocaine is an alkaloid, alkaloid extracted from coca leaves. It's been used in medicine. It has analges analgesic and anesthetic properties. Um, cocaine dependency is an addiction to this very narcotic. There's, a li there's literature uh, in the description for those of you who want to explore further. Sherlock Holmes was an imaginary figure, of course. He was a consulting detective in literature. And he occasionally used cocaine and morphine to escape from what he called the dull routine of existence. <laughs> Sounds very psychopathic, by the way. But if you take into account the period and the city, Victorian times in London, it was nothing out of the ordinary, nothing unusual. Opium, laudanum, cocaine, and morphine <clears throat> were all legal and sold in a, on every street corner in forms of tinctures and powder and you name it. There were even morphine dens run typically by Chinese immigrants. And Victorian users um, consumed these drugs as you and I would consume a good glass of red wine. They did it for self-medication and they did it for recreation and they did it for no reason at all. <laughs> Holmes was a recreational user. He didn't have any medical problems that required the use of cocaine, although he did have some medical problems that required the administering of morphine. He believed that he, needs, he needed stimulation for his overactive brains. brain. He said that when there are no interesting cases to solve, um, then he is bound to become manic and out of control and cocaine was the only way to somehow subdue, subdue himself. He had no concept or idea of the side effects of drug use, which is very funny because the author, Arthur Conan Doyle, was actually a medical doctor. 
He was, Holmes was in a, had an addictive personality. He was a compulsive smoker. He was an avid and repetitive drinker of good alcohol, as I mentioned. But the only drugs which he used to access, access were cocaine and morphine. Now, cocaine was introduced into the United Kingdom more or less in the mid-19th century. In the second half of the 19th century, there was a cocaine craze. There were cocaine, coke enthusiasts. There were scientists and medical professionals who were advocating the use of cocaine for an infinite number of medical ailments and diseases. There, were, there was advertising in newspapers there was, and much later in the 19th century, there was Coke, Coca-Cola, which was originally based on a recipe which included cocaine. <laughs> that's why it's called Coca-Cola, and that's why we use the word Coke. And so there were letters, there were pamphlets, there were essays about the miraculous properties of the divine drug, as it was called. And this excited people very much. Um, there was cocaine seemed to have been the panacea, uh, a cure for all, all ailments, anything from toothache to hysteria, just give the guy or the girl coke. <laughs> now people were snorting coke. It was Sigmund Freud actually who came up with the idea of injecting coke, um, which was a novelty at the time. So labor pains, hay fever, melancholy, hysteria, toothache, tummy ache, I mean, you name it, Coke was it. This was the medication. Um, Sigmund Freud, as I mentioned, lived in Vienna, in Austria, uh, towards the late, the latter third of the 19th century. And he recommend, recommended cocaine therapy for anemia, asthma, syphilis, typhus, and even for the treatment of addictions such as morphine or alcohol habits and addictions. <laughs> he later discovered, and I'll come to it in the second half of the video, he later discovered that cocaine may be more addictive than the very addictions that he was trying to cure. Now, Lester Grinspoon and James Bacalar wrote a book about cocaine and the social, social evolution of the use of cocaine in initially in good company, the upper strata of society, and then how it trickled down. And today it's the hallmark of either the criminal underworld or reckless psychopaths in the world of finance and so on and so forth. So here's what they have to say. The most famous after Freud of all the Victorian intellectuals who used coca cocaine was the fictional detective Sherlock Holmes. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, his creator, was a physician who practiced for a while as an ophthalmologist. He must have been intimately acquainted with the properties of the drug and may have used it himself as a stimulant. Dr. Watson, Doyle's narrator, first mentions cocaine in The Sign of Four, published in 1890. At that time, Holmes was injecting a 7% solution <clears throat> intravenously, intravenously, three times a day, apparently a large dose. Since Watson reports asking uh, when he saw Holmes with the needle, whether it was morphine or cocaine, Holmes seems to have had more than one drug habit. But we hear no more of morphine from Watson. In the spirit of mock scholarship with which Sherlock Holmes studies are conducted, we might guess that Holmes was one of those addicts who used cocaine to withdraw from morphine and simply replace one drug with another, which is what Freud had recommended, by the way. Holmes admitted that cocaine was bad for him physically, but found it, I quote, transcendentally stimulating and clarifying to the mind. However, he did not use it when working on a case, but only to dispel boredom when he had nothing better to do. In connection with a later case, the yellow face, Watson again mentions the occasional use of cocaine as Holmes' only vice. After a while, he began to see it 
is more than a casual indulgence. In the adventure of the missing three-quarter, which ostensibly took place in about 1897, Watson refers to a drug mania that had threatened Holmes' career. Watson claims to have cured him of it, but says the fiend was not dead, but sleeping. In later life, Holmes' only drug habit, like Freud's, was tobacco. In a study in Scarlet, 1887, there was a novel in which the famous consulting detective um, was introduced. Dr. Watson, friend, assistant, flatmate, acolyte, <laughs> an amnesis of, of uh, Sherlock Holmes, is very concerned about Holmes's use of drugs. He says, Watson says, nothing could exceed his energy when the working feat was upon him. But now and again, a reaction would seize him, and for, day, for days on end, he would lie upon the sofa in the sitting room, hardly uttering a word or moving a muscle from morning to night. On these occasions, I have noticed such a dreamy, vacant expression on, in his eyes that I might have suspected him of being addicted to the use of some narcotic. Had not the temperance and cleanliness of his whole life forbidden such a notion. But Dr. Watson knew better. Gradually, he came to realize that Sherlock Holmes was an addict. Watson kept denying that Holmes' drug addiction, or drug habit, was a compulsion, because he claimed that Sherlock Holmes only occasionally injects cocaine, and such occasional use is very common in Victorian England, was very common in Victorian England, and therefore Sherlock Holmes was not an addict. Holmes claims that these drugs stimulate his mind in periods of idleness. The great detective's cocaine habit is also described in the second novel, The Sign of Four, and it begins with the scene when Sherlock Holmes injects himself a 7% solution of cocaine. And here's, here's a segment, an excerpt from the novel. Sherlock Holmes took his bottle from the corner of the mantelpiece and his hypodermic syringe from its neat Morocco case. With his long, white, nervous fingers, he adjusted the delicate needle and rolled back his left shirt cuff. For some little time, his eyes rested thoughtfully upon the sinewy for forearm and wrist, all dotted and scarred with innum innumerable puncture marks. Finally, Holmes thrust the sharp point home, pressed down the tiny piston, and sank back into the velvet-lined armchair with a long sigh of satisfaction. Holmes, therefore, was most definitely an addict. Holmes took the drug by direct injection, which again was Freud's recommendation. He was not interested in taking lozenges, uh, lozenges or drinking uh, vin mariani which contained cocaine or snorting or whatever he wanted it directly to the bloodstream <laughs> or directly to the muscle at least um, or in his case it was actually the veins the bloodstream holmes disregarded the negative physical effects of cocaine holmes generally was in great denial about great many things he had a pathological personality of course but he was aware he says, for example, in, uh, in one of the stories, he says, I suppose that its influence is physically a bad one. I find it, however, so transcendentally stimulating and clarifying to the mind that its secondary action is a matter of small moment. Dr. Watson knew more about the side effects of cocaine, and he hated Holmes's intravenous drug use. He warned Holmes repeatedly that abuse of any drug could jeopardize his excellent career, ruin his health, and even affect his mind, which is what Holmes cared about the most. Holmes was a cerebral narcissist and a bit of a psychopath. Watson is registered as saying in one of the stories, but consider, I said earnestly, says Watson, count the cost 
your brain may, as you say, be roused and excited, but it is a pathological and morbid process, which involves increased tissue change and may at least leave a permanent weakness. You know, too, what a black reaction comes upon you. Surely the game is hardly worth a candle. Why should you, for a mere passing pleasure, risk the loss of those great powers with which you have been endowed? Remember that I speak not only as one comrade to another, but as a medical man to one for whose consultation he is to some extent, a uh, constitution, I'm sorry, he is to some extent answerable. But Holmes keeps ignoring the admonitions of Dr. Watson. He replies that his dependency, his pharmacodependency, is a result of his overactive brain, and his brain constantly needs stimulation, an interesting case to solve, or in the absence of an interesting case, a psychotropic drug. He, Holmes needs to dull his senses because he's afraid of a hostile takeover by his brain. He's afraid of madness and insanity, actually. Today, Sherlock Holmes would have been diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, Asperger's syndrome, I mean, level one, autism spectrum disorder, narcissism, narcissistic personality disorder, and probably antisocial personality disorder. He says, Holmes, Sherlock Holmes says, my mind re rebels at stagnation. Give me problems, give me work, give me the most abstruse cryptogram or the most intricate analysis and I am in my own proper atmosphere. I can dispense them with artificial stimulants, but I abhor the dull routine of existence. I crave for mental exaltation. That's something a psychopath would say, absolutely. Holmes was logically astute but socially inapt. They had no social skills, and that's very common in autism spectrum disorders. And unlike Dr. Watson, Holmes was asexual and antisocial. He preferred logic to emotions. He was a misogynist, and he lacked empathy with people in general. In The Adventure of the Missing Three Quarter, Watson tells how Holmes gradually dissuaded um, was dissuaded by him from the drug habit. Watson attributes to himself a success of winning Sherlock Holmes of the drug habit. He convinced Holmes to quit taking drugs. And here's what Watson has to say. For years, I had gradually winned him from that drug mania, which had threatened once to check his remarkable career. Now I knew that under ordinary conditions, he no longer craved for this artificial stimulus. But I was well aware that the fiend was not dead, but sleeping. The problem was that Holmes abused multiple drugs. I mentioned cocaine, I mentioned morphine, but there's also opium. For example, in The Man with the Twisted Lip, Dr. Watson accidentally stumbles on Sherlock Holmes, disguised as an old man, sitting in an East London opium den. Uh, uh, Holmes assures Watson that he does not indulge in opium smoking. He is not doing anything at the den but spying and detecting. But he had, he tells Watson, he had to buy some opium because this was an undercover investigation and he had to conform to the character. Um, Probably he wasn't addicted to opiates, but it would stand to reason that he did use them from time to time. He was also a compulsive smoker. So I'm not going to the smoking part, um, although exactly like Freud, uh, Sherlock Holmes was later in life a pipe smoker. Freud started with cigars, you know, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. And uh, smoking became a habit with him. Now, in Victorian England, tobacco smoking was regarded both pleasurable and therapeutic. There were, there were advertisements, tobacco cures and heals. Smoking a pipe, smoking a cigar was limited to men, 
a woman who would smoke in public was probably a prostitute or worse. And cigarettes entered the scene after the Crimean War, probably from Russia, another gift that Russia gave the West. And by the end of the 19th century, every self-respecting British male was a smoker. It was a mass production of cigarettes, started in the 1880s, and cigarettes were recommended for recreational use, social bonding, but also as a form of relief of asthma, bronchial trouble, respiratory problems, believe it or not. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes was a smoker, and he said that smoking refreshed his mind. He smoked everything, you name it, cigarettes, cigars, pipes, anything that didn't move and could produce smoke was in Sherlock Holmes' lips. He kept his cigars in a scuttle or slipper besides the fireplace in his apartment in Baker Street. Dr. Watson was not averse to smoking. He was a pipe smoker and occasionally he smoked a cigar, but he never smoked cigarettes, to his credit. Holmes smoked a pipe when he was in a contemplative mood. It's the famous, the famous image of uh, Sherlock Holmes with his pipe with the huge you know, bowel. But when he was agitated, he smoked cigarettes and he was pacing the drawing rooms, puffing and huffing and so on. He smoked a cigar, uh, usually a Cuban cigar, after a meal at a restaurant or, or in the company of Brandy. <laughs> he had three pipes made of clay, briarwood and cherrywood. The clay was his most favorite one. And so in a study of Scarlet, he smokes a pipe. Uh, so, exactly like, you know, crime scene, crime scene investigators, CSI, Holmes was interested in various brands of tobacco as evidence. In the sign of four, Holmes say, speaks about his scientific interest in tobacco ashes. He says, yes, I've been guilty of several monographs. They're all upon technical subjects. Here, for example, is one upon the distinction between the ashes of the various tobaccos. In it, I enumerate 140 forms of cigar, cigarette, and pipe tobacco, with colored plates illustrating the difference in the ash. It is a point which is continually turning up in criminal trials, and which is sometimes of supreme importance as a clue. If you can say definitely, for example, that some murder has been done by a man who was smoking an Indian Lanka, it probably and obviously narrows your field of search. To the trained eye, there is no, there is as much difference between the black ash of a trichinopoly and the white fluff of bird's eye as there is between cabbage and potato. Whew, that was a heavy one. Okay, so Holmes was an addict and uh, uh, an epitome and an embodiment of physical power, hegemonic masculinity, male friendship, comradeship with Dr. Watson, strident misogyny, all coupled with drug habits. The typical male profile, definitely towards the end of the 19th century, and a male profile that had affected masculinity, perceptions of masculinity in other countries because of the wide reach and outreach of the British Empire, similar to the impact the, that the United States has today on male and female perception and gender roles all over the world. And so it's not surprising that someone like Freud, who traveled widely within Europe and was uh, exposed to British culture, art, literature, civilization. It's not a surprise that he took great interest in cocaine. And the connection, relation between psychoanalysis and cocaine is pretty intimate. Initially, Freud used the substance. Remember that Freud was not a psychologist. Like most major figures in psychology, Freud was not a psychologist actually. And like many, many major figures in economics who were not economists, 
So in these branch, in these branches of the social sciences, um, outsiders and contributed the most. Anyhow, Freud was a neurologist, not a psychologist. So initially, he experimented with cocaine as an ophthalmic, ophthalmic anesthetic, eye surgery anesthetic. Uh, it was used in Vienna in 1884 for the first time. He conducted research into the physiological action of cocaine, and he wanted to use it for therapeutic purposes, mainly in surgery. His colleague, Karl Köhler, continued this work, and he was the one who discovered the anesthetic properties of cocaine um, and used it in, in eye surgery, but it, Freud was the engine behind, behind all of it. Now, Freud wrote about this chapter in his life. A side interest, though it was a deep one, had led me in 1884 to obtain from, from Merck some of what was then the little-known alkaloid, cocaine, and to study its physiological action. I suggested, however, to my friend Königstein, the ophthalmologist, that he should investigate the question of how far the anesthetizing properties of cocaine were applicable in diseases of the eye. So, in 1884, Freud didn't seek any see or seek any connection between cocaine and psychology because he himself was deeply into neurology mostly the nerves central nervous system the brain and so on. in 1953 Ernst Jones reported that um, Freud administered injections of cocaine to his friend Ernst von Fleischel and that's because von Fleischel was addicted to morphine and he had huge neuralgia huge pains in the nerves. And so Freud tried to ease these pains and wean von Fleischel off the morphine addiction by injecting cocaine. But then he noticed a year later that massive doses of cocaine uh, led to chronic intoxication. He discovered the toxicity of cocaine and he recoiled. Freud began to bec became very worried about the impacts of cocaine medicinally and he he become he became a doubter he no longer regarded cocaine strictly as a medicine um, and yet he didn't realize that cocaine is as addictive as morphine he didn't realize the addictive properties of cocaine coca leaves and cocaine have been used in the americas as stimulants to fight fatigue and hunger but their use led to neurochemical and physiological effects and severe addiction problems. It was known in the Americas, but not in Europe, and definitely not to Freud. When Freud came up with psychoanalysis decades later, he studied the underlying dynamics and the unconscious fantasies that drive patients to seek chemical and physiological effects of drugs such as cocaine in a compulsive manner. In other words, he was studying addiction. He realized that addiction is almost impossible to cure. And so he studied the pathological structures that underlie addiction. He suggested that there's a process of pathological mourning, grief, or some kind of manic depressive behavior in most of these patients. They were grieving something. They were depressive. They were, and they were trying to compensate by using drugs. Patients sought out these toxic substances as stimulants or antidepressants in order to conceal, even from themselves, states of depression, said Freud. Some drug addicts un were unable to work through their grief, and so they develop pathological mourning. Today we call it prolonged grief syndrome. They develop pathological, oh, prolonged grief disorder, I'm sorry. They develop pathological mourning. And he came up with this elaborate story that these patients were mourning or grieving over a lost dead object. And so they were unconsciously putting their lives in grave danger. It wasn't exactly clear why. Was it a form of self-punishment? But it was clear that these people were repeatedly taking risks, life-threatening risks, 
as if they were confronting death and conquering it. And by conquering it, by winning by in this competition with death, they were resuscitated. They were revived. It was a fantasy resurrection. And it represented success as far as these addicts uh, were involved. So that's why they kept using drugs. Because the addiction was to the resurrection, not to the drug. The addiction was to beating death, not to the drug. He said that there is a mental state where the psychological notions of danger, death, and suicide do not exist. Of course, Freud didn't know at the time about the neurological, neurochemical, and neurotoxic impacts of addiction, how it changes the brain and how it conditions the individual to continue to consume the drug. He was just trying to uncover and to somehow interpret the resurrection fantasies that led addicts to give up living within a dead object and give up identifying uh, with a dead person. He believed, in short, the drugs made these people come alive. And today, when we discuss self-harm and self-mutilation in disorders such as borderline personality disorder, we say more or less the same. It makes them feel alive, either by suppressing inner turmoil and dysregulation, or by causing pain and harm, which kind of wake them up to their own existence. And so, Freud contributed enormously to the intellectual discourse of the 20th century. I'm not quite sure about his psychology, but he was definitely a leading literary and intellectual figure. But he also contributed to the popularity of cocaine. And this became a huge scourge. One could pretty safely say that Freud was the father of drug addiction, or at least the legitimizer of drug addiction. In the late 19th century, cocaine seemed to possess some promise, kind of, as I men mentioned, a, a versatile panacea. Um, and people were looking to South America, and they were saying, look at South America, people use cocaine there habitually, and they cure all kinds of things, and they're free of disease, and, and so on and so forth. And so this led Freud to study the properties and potential uses of cocaine. Um, there were reports by German army doctors about experimenting with cocaine to improve even impotence or to overcome impotence, kind of precursor or, or earlier kind, earlier day predecessor of Viagra. Freud's interest in cocaine was intensified by his curiosity about whether he could apply it in his clinical practice, especially to his friends. Freud always worked with with friends and family, and he, he was kind of an intimate uh, guy. So he had this friend, Dr. Ernst von Fleischel Marxhoff, and the guy was a physiological researcher, and he studied the nervous system in Ernst uh, Buch's laboratory. Anyhow, this guy, he started his career as a pathologist, and then he lost a finger to amputation. Luckily, he stayed alive. He didn't get infected. There was no penicillin, uh, no antibiotics at the time. But anyhow, he lost his finger to amputation. He had an accident during an autopsy. And so he was in near constant excruciating pain because he had peripheral nerve damage during this amputation. And so he, he, he had a beautiful career. He was very famous. He made many discoveries about the brain. Uh, he was the one who discovered that there's electricity in in, on, in, in the brain, especially in the, cere in the cerebral cortex. He discovered sensory stimulation in the brain, weak charges, which were not detected before. He demonstrated the first use of electroencephalography, EEG, in animals. So he was a major brain uh, uh, scholar or brain researcher. He developed various medical tools and instruments and these were widely used, so he was, he was a very important doctor, but he was in pain. He was always battling severe pain, and he became addicted to morphine and heroin, the synthetic equivalent of morphine. So Freud was very um, distressed 
by the pain of constant pain of his friend, and he obtained a sample of cocaine from Merck, as I said before. And he tried. He began to experiment. With it. He, he first thing he did, he ingested small doses of cocaine himself, and he documented his sensations, his reactions. This was very common in the medical world well into the 1950s or 60s, experimenting on what first and first and foremost experimenting on oneself and then on, on others. Anyhow, Freud noticed uh, during this self-experimentation, he noticed that cocaine caused the numbing of his lips and tongue when he ingested it orally. He used, as, as distinct from Sherlock Holmes, he used a 5% solution. And he used a 5% solution to cure intestinal pains and so on and so forth, and he ingested it. He simply ate it. He ate the powder. And his lips and tongue, tongue became totally numb. And he said to himself, wow, this is useful. Um, this could serve as an anesthetic. And it was Freud who told his friend, Karl Köhler, the ophthalmologist, before he left Vienna, uh, he told him about this anesthetic property. When Freud returned to Vienna, he found that Kohler experimented on animals and on himself, and Kohler discovered that cocaine effectively rendered eyes, at least, impervious to pain. You could operate and there was no pain. Anesthetic. Kohler presented his discovery, um, and this was the first effective local anesthetic. And this revolutionized surgical practice. And and then, people, and then cocaine became a, a global hysteria, absolutely global hysteria. Everyone and his, and his dog and his mother-in-law wanted to experiment with cocaine. The cocaine was numbing pain. It was amazing and shocking. And then Freud said to himself, if it numbs pain, pains locally, maybe I can use it with my friend, Fleischl. Maybe I can, I can break his addiction to opiates like morphine and heroin. And so he recommended it to Fleischl. He also, Freud also wrote a journal article. You can see it in the description. It was titled uh, appropriately on cocaine. And in this article, Freud reported his own experiences and uncritically advocated to use cocaine for a wide range of applications. So the drug, let it be clear, was legal. It was poorly understood. There's no concept of addiction. And it was common then to go out all the way, you know, all the whole nine yards to the very end with any new kind of medicine or invention and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and in this article, Freud made a series of observations. He described cocaine as less harmful than alcohol. And he characterized cocaine as, I'm quoting, not detrimental to the body. He recommended cocaine, Freud recommended cocaine as a treatment choice for stomach trouble, uh, if you overate, for nervous disorders of the digestive system, what we call today IBC, um, irritable bowel syndrome. He recommended long-term use of cocaine for anemia and degenerative tissue ailments. He cited the use of cocaine as an aphrodisiac in South America, suggested that directly applying cocaine to the penis is a cure, sure cure for impotence. Freud recounted the case in the article. He recounted the case of a young writer um, who succeeded to resume his work after, after an illness, having consumed cocaine. And yet this young writer had to stop taking cocaine because he was overcome by sexual excitement as a side effect, <laughs> hypersexuality. Where Freud's friend Fleischl Marxo was concerned, the recommendation of cocaine as a way to eliminate withdrawal symptoms from morphine, or making these symptoms at least tolerable, was a major revelation. Fleischl said to himself, I'm addicted to opiates, I'm addicted to morphine, I'm addicted to heroin, I can't live without them, they're having horrible effects on my body, maybe I should try cocaine. Freud said in a passage that was then cited hundreds of times, he said that cocaine 
will not replace one addiction with another. In other words, cocaine will not create addiction. One can simply stop taking cocaine once the addiction to morphine has been bitten, said Freud. And so this article was widely read and very influential and confirmed the initial impressions of other researchers. But within two years of the publication of this article, Freud himself stopped taking cocaine regularly. He continued to take it occasionally, it seems, but never regularly. No one knows why. Probably Freud had discovered the addictive properties of cocaine and did not share them with the world, because that would have meant negating what he had said. I'm not quite sure, but it's a mystery to this very day. Why did he stop the habit and why didn't he share his findings? Um, Freud also stopped writing about cocaine or advocating its use. It seems that Fleischmann's experience had something to do with it. He did beat his addiction to opiates to some extent, to some extent, but he developed an additional addiction to cocaine. So now he was addicted to morphine, or, uh, heroin, and first and foremost to cocaine. And then he died. He died at age 50, 45. And it would stand to reason that he died of over, an overdose. I think this shook Freud to the foundations. He realized the mistake that he has made. He realized that he has killed his best friend. Um, and then Freud compounded his mistake. Uh, he recommended that the cocaine should be delivered via injection, not orally uh, in a weak water solution, uh, but by injection, not by snorting, but by injection. So Freud not only denied the addictive properties of cocaine, but he made it much worse by advocating and recommending injection. So Freud came to be associated with cocaine, with the worst aspects of cocaine and the worst way to use cocaine. And there is no exonerating him because he was responsible. He was responsible for this. And once people got addicted based on his advice, they couldn't go back. There were no rehabs. And even today, rehabs are inefficacious. Again, what could safely say that Freud had been a major contributor to the emergence of substance abuse and drug addiction in modern life and modern history. And this is a dark corner of his personality and his history and his autobiography that is often glossed over or ignored when we talk about the men. The dark side of Sigmund Freud is reflected in Sherlock Holmes, a narcissist, a psychopath, and a mentally ill person who was addicted, among other things, to cocaine.